So let's start looking at the reliability challenges facing the new Defender. And as I see it, there are three main challenges. The first one is the complexity of the vehicle. They've chosen to add in, as standard, a number of systems which in reality aren't strictly essential. Now this is utterly outside my experience. When designing industrial facilities, you start off with the design requirements and you design the very simplest possible facilities which meet the design requirements. Partly to save cost, but also because simplicity means reliability. The second main challenge is the amount of software which goes into uh, driving these new vehicles, tying together all of the microprocessors and so forth. However, we all know from experience that new software is unreliable. There's a new release of Windows and almost from day one, Microsoft is issuing security patches and updates. And the third main challenge is the amount of new technology which goes into these vehicles. Now, a very interesting statistic is that in the oil and gas industry, the average lead time from the release of a new te uh, technology to the first commercial application is of the order of seven years. About half of this period is taken up doing all of the proving trials, the demonstrations and getting type approval. And I would mention that there are international standards which cover this. And the rest of the time normally taken up by customer resistance. No one wants to be the first customer for a new technology. Everyone is waiting for someone else to commit first and they will see if the technology works or not. It seems to be quite the opposite uh, with these new vehicles where they're rushing to get new technology out. So in summary, with the new Defender, we've actually got a perfect storm for potential reliability problems. Before we go any further, I'd like to put things into context. Now, people will say, with some justification, the modern vehicles and their control systems are very complex and they involve a number of different types of sensors too. However, I see nothing more than a DCS, or Distributed Control System. And in this, well, we've got the sensors, we've got the electronic controllers, we've got the items being controlled, which are typically actuators, we've got an operator interface, and it's all connected together by a data bus. And this can, of course, be scaled up to any size, as this photo indicates. Now, the workhorse of the automotive system is the ECU, or Electronic Control Unit, whereas in the DCS, it's a PLC, or Programmable Logic Controller. And look at the difference in the packaging. PLCs are very robust. They also tend to be bulkier because they've usually got an internal stabilised power supply for reliability. So on the overall scale of things, maybe vehicle control systems aren't so complex after all. Now I predicted a perfect storm for reliability problems, and if we believe what we see on the internet, that would appear to be the case. Several channels have sprung up on YouTube where people are reporting huge reliability problems with their new Defenders. The very worst example being a channel in the US, they bought a basic new Defender. They were going to make videos about doing trips in this vehicle, but they can't. They are already on their third Defender because the first two developed problems, which even Land Rover couldn't rectify. Absolutely appalling. Now all is not lost. It would be possible to greatly improve the reliability of this vehicle. But I'm afraid to say, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think Land Rover is even very interested in this. Now for me, step one would be to release what I will call a Defender Lite, and that would be a new Defender with as many of the optional unnecessary gizmos removed as possible. And also to go back to um, tried, tested, mature technology and no need to reintroduce the new technology when it's been properly re-qualified. And the sorts of things I have in mind um, would be the surround camera system, who needs it, and also the dual sim infotainment system, which you aren't even going to be able to use when doing a long expedition off grid. Now I do realise that, that the amount of simplification possible is rather limited by the architecture of the vehicle. Such things as the use of the active ride height air suspension, 
and also the use of independent suspension with traction control. And both of these introduce a lot of complexity into the vehicle with the attendant reliability problems compared to, say, a 4x4 with live axles on coil springs. Now I've seen that somewhere before, I wonder where. Now even if we don't get a Defender light, there's still an awful lot which can be done to improve the reliability. And I'm going to be looking at the electronics in particular, because experience shows that that's where most of the problems tend to arise. The first big question with the DCS is where does the hardware come from? In the process industries, one deals almost exclusively with the big reputable name manufacturers. So in the States, you've got companies like Honeywell and GE. In Europe, you've got ABB, Siemens, Bosch, and companies like uh, Toshiba in the Far East. And I'd very much hope that Land Rover, as a self-proclaimed manufacturer of premium vehicles that they buy from the same sorts of companies. If, on the other hand, they're procuring from China from suppliers selected on the lowest cost basis, they have no chance. And second big question is what standards are being used for the manufacturer? Now, the gold standard in this regard always comes from the military because obviously for them reliability is paramount and if they're not already doing so I'd strongly suggest that, man uh, that Land Rover ought to manufacture to these standards or to close civilian equivalents and if they did that it would be a massive step in the right direction. Change of scene, come down to the extreme south of Europe, not too many people, very beautiful Good weather for this time of year too. Couldn't ask for much more actually. There's still a hell of a lot that can be done to improve reliability. And these are all standard techniques. So for example, to combat the spate of early age failures to which the new Defender seems to be particularly prone, for the critical components, you subject them to enhanced quality control and a process called burning. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to flatten out the failure rate curve and you remove the initial spike and so the curve remains constant until you get the wear out failures at the end of life. Now burning is a process of testing for an extended period of time under elevated stress conditions and this will weed out all of the substandard components which will fail and only the best ones go into the production vehicle. There's also a process of systematic reduction of uh, harmful stress conditions. Now for load bearing components, I'm talking about physical stresses and particularly fatigue stresses, for other components well, it's the usual suspects. So we've got, for example, extreme temperatures, both high and low, shock, vibration, moisture, dirt and dust, power surges. And you have to work through the vehicle, stem to stern and system by system. And every time you encounter harmful stress conditions, you redesign as necessary to remove them. Another one, derating components. Good example when you're matching an engine to a transmission. Don't put in transmission which is designed to exactly the same power and torque as the engine, but give yourself a healthy margin and that'll have a huge impact on its reliability. For really critical components, you can have redundancy. And this is already done, for example, with braking systems where you have dual circuits. This technique, of course, is used hugely in aircraft design. And finally, testing the finished vehicle. Now I have no idea what Land Rover do to test their vehicles once they roll off the production line. In the oil and gas industry, when you're building a new platform, there's a process called soak testing. Now firstly, you commission the platform in the yard, uh, item by item, system by system, and then you liven up the platform and you try to simulate conditions offshore and run it for a few weeks in the yard. And by God, this flushes out all sorts of hidden problems. I don't know what Land Rover are doing, but it's clearly not enough. And it appears to me that too much of the production testing is being left down to the poor old owner. Now, the reliability measures I've been talking about so far can be effective 
But the fact is, much more can be achieved at the tactical and the strategic level. Let me explain. If you go to the JLR website, you'll find that there are three Target Zero campaigns. So I call it Zero Mission, Zero Accident, Zero Congestion. All fine lofty ideals, um, but probably taking many, many years to achieve, are not entirely under the control of the company. Now, I'm a great believer in Target Zero campaigns. They can be very effective. But how about a more down-to-earth Target Zero campaign? Zero failures, zero warranty claims. And if they did that, that would start to turn the tide. But the fact is, they need to change the culture and the thinking of the Land Rover management. Now, as I said earlier, through reliability modelling and financial modelling, they already know what level of uh, reliability failures they're likely to have and the attendant cost, both to the company and to the long-suffering owner. And yet they still plough ahead going down the same path. And I find that absolutely appalling. To me, it seems they're just not interested. However, there is a silver bullet, but it would need to be fired by the company's owners, Tata. If they called in the chief executive and said your job and the jobs of your other directors are on the line if within three years you aren't in the top half of the JD Power reliability survey, that would do it. They're all competent managers and I'm quite sure they'd make it happen. Now, if anyone from the automotive industry is watching this video, I'm sure there'll be howls of derision. He doesn't know what he's talking about and you can't possibly afford to adopt these measures in new vehicles. I'll turn it around the other way. Can you afford not to do it? If you've got a vehicle which is going back under warranty every few months to the dealer, and probably for a number of years, it's going to cost an absolute fortune, and far more than it would cost to adopt some, if not all, of the measures I've suggested. Regarding my knowledge, I've already said I don't come from the automotive industry. However, I do know what it takes to make industrial facilities reliable, and they are orders of magnitude more complicated than any vehicle.